Hello, and welcome to the Current Science and Technology podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm Brenda Muniappen, your host. Every week, we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. In this segment, we'll learn how nanoparticles can be used to destroy bacteria. Although most bacteria are friendly to humans, a few are not. We've discussed fighting bacteria with antibiotics and vaccines, and today we'll discuss a promising nanotechnology tool. The museum's Corrine Tate is here to describe this in detail. Hi, Corrine. Hi, Brenda. How is this nanotechnology approach different from our current methods of battling disease-causing bacteria? Well, usually we use traditional antibiotics to fight bacterial infections. And these antibiotics, what they do is they interfere with the bacteria's DNA or they interfere with a specific metabolic pathway of the bacteria and basically prevent it from reproducing in that way. This nanoparticle doesn't take that type of chemical attack. It does something a little different. And what it does is it just physically attacks the bacteria and basically tears it apart. Well, how does it do that? How does a particle attack a living thing like a bacteria, but of course not attack a living thing like a human cell, which we would not want it to interfere with? Definitely. This nanoparticle is made of special polymers. And some of these polymers are hydrophilic, meaning they're water soluble, and some are hydrophobic. And when you put them in a fluid like blood, for example, they self assemble, these polymers self assemble into this nanoparticle that's about 200 nanometers across. And the hydrophobic part is in the inside, and all the hydrophilic areas are on the outside of the nanoparticle. And these hydrophilic areas are tailored to interact with the bacteria. They're basically chemically tailored to bind to the bacteria. And the nanoparticles are positively charged. They have a very specific electrical charge, and it's attracted to the negatively charged bacteria. When it's attracted to the bacteria, it actually binds to the surface. That disrupts the surface and basically starts poking holes in the surface. So the contents of the bacterial cell just spill out. So first of all, it's very cool that these nanoparticles can self-assemble inside the body. I guess in a large enough concentration, they find their partnering components and come together. You also mentioned that these particles can target negatively charged bacterial cells. So these nanoparticles, because they're positively charged, are attracted to the negatively charged bacteria. Why aren't they attracted to human cells, which also have a negative charge? These nanoparticles, when they're manufactured, are basically manufactured with a very specific electrical charge. And that makes them very selective just for the bacteria over human cells. But you bring up a good point about these human cells and and similar treatments that were created in the past that work a similar way have actually failed because they did interact with human cells. But early biological testing for this nanoparticle shows that it's, it's not interacting with human cells. And even in small animals, it hasn't really affected any of the major organs. So it, right now it's very promising. So these nanoparticles can distinguish between bacteria and human cells seemingly fairly well. Are these nanoparticles useful against all kinds of bacteria? Because we do have a pretty huge variety out there. They found that they're effective against a lot of microbes, specifically the gram-positive bacteria, which includes a lot of the infections that we're worried about, like the drug-resistant staph, for example. And then they also found that nanoparticles kill fungi. But there are some types of bacteria that the nanoparticles don't work against because they have more complex cell membranes, so it doesn't interact in the same way. But they are hoping they could kind of chemically tailor these nanoparticles to work against different kinds of bacteria. Okay. These nanoparticles, they get inside the bacteria and they actually burst them open. They lyse them open. So the bacteria don't have a chance of reproducing and developing resistance against the nanoparticles. And that's a fairly unique way of targeting bacteria, isn't it? 
It is, and that's very important for this particular treatment because drug resistance or antibiotic resistance is, is really a growing problem for us. Bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics as quickly as a decade or two. They get a genetic mutation that might allow them to survive the antibiotic in some way. Either the genetic mutation will allow them to inactivate the drug or it'll change the target site where the antibiotic binds to the bacterial cell or it just changes the metabolic pathway that the antibiotic attacks. Through natural selection, these genetic mutations allow these bacteria to survive, and then they pass them on when they replicate and divide. And those are all kind of chemical attacks that these genetic mutations can help them overcome. The idea that this nanoparticle really launches a physical attack that tears apart the cell, poking holes in the membrane, it's such a dramatic attack on the bacterial cell. It's thought that the bacteria won't be able to evolve a defense against it quickly. Karine, you mentioned that there have been attempts at making a product that could physically burst a bacteria, but those attempts previously were not very successful, I assume by other groups. Is the ability of these nanoparticles to target the exact negative charge of the bacteria or simply the fact that these are nanoparticles make this particular tool so promising? Well, the previous drugs that kind of worked in the same way attacking the bacteria were unsuccessful because they were either toxic to human cells, they weren't selective enough just for the bacteria, or for other reasons, they just simply didn't work in such a complex environment like the human body. But the researchers at IBM who created these nanoparticles have found that they are very selective for the bacteria. They haven't shown any damage to human cells. And so far, they haven't shown any toxicity to major organs in animal trials. So they are kind of moving along to the next step in larger animal models and hopefully clinical trials eventually. Why are researchers at IBM working on antibiotics? That seems not their normal field. You're absolutely right. And it is kind of odd. These guys are materials scientists at IBM, and they normally work on nanoparticles for their semiconductor manufacturing. But in working there, they came across these very promising self-assembling polymers, and there was some inkling that they would be useful. They're not doing the biological testing themselves. They're working with the Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology in Singapore. They're actually doing the biological testing. And IBM is not looking to get into the pharmaceutical industry long term. Right now, they're just working on kind of scaling up to get enough nanoparticles to really do extensive clinical trials. And then they might license out to a healthcare company to manufacture this pharmaceutical. Well, this is another fine example of how a discovery in one field actually can have applications in an entirely different one. And in this case, as you mentioned, the IBM researchers don't have to do the biological testing. They can partner with experts who know how to do that. Exactly. This is one case like we see in all areas of nanotechnology where it's really interdisciplinary and you get scientists from all different areas of science working together to make these new breakthroughs. Well, Corrine, thank you very much for telling us all about this new nanotech antibiotic. My pleasure, Brenda. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, 